Hey, welcome to Dakari's second live virtual training. Tonight we have Cameron Novak, an electrical engineer with the ATF. And Cameron is going to talk to us tonight about receptacle fires and other electrical issues that you can come across when investigating fires. Cameron, go ahead. All right. Can everybody hear me yet? We got you, bud. All right, let me share the screen. Share computer sound. Make sure I got all this working. All right. Can you see that, Bill? Gotcha. Looks great. All right. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. Um, like Bill said, my name is Cameron Novak. I'm an electrical and fire protection engineer with the ATS Fire Research Lab. Um, the quick primer on the FRL, um, the labs in Maryland, we've got four labs around the country, three forensic science labs that do your typical fire debris, explosives, prints, DNA, all that stuff. And then one fire research lab, which has about 12 engineers. There's four electrical engineers, including myself, and then maybe six or seven fire protection engineers or fire research engineers. We're available to travel and respond all across the country to um, any kind of fire incidents that you need help with. Uh, so if you ever need some sort of assistance, it doesn't even have to be a crime. All you have to do is get a hold of your local ATF CFI and they're kind of your conduit to us. Um, I'm kind of in a unique situation. I'm actually based out of the St. Paul field office in Minnesota. Um, I'm kind of the guinea pig for a project of putting engineers in the field so that they're closer to the agents so there's not as much of a delay with travel time getting the scenes. So without further ado, tonight we're going to talk about electrical receptacles. Um, this is actually a little bit of a cut down version of um, what Devin Palmer and I, one of our ATF CFIs, were going to teach at the IAAI ITC on Friday. So this is a little bit more condensed version of that. We had about two hours to speak, so I cut it down to fit in about one. So we'll try and squeeze all of that in. So first things first, um, my opinion and the way I've taught fire investigation and electrical analysis or electrical forensics is you have to know what something looks like and how it's supposed to work under normal circumstances before you can ever really get into how it's supposed to fail and what it looks like. So there's predominantly in, in our residential structures, um, we're going to have either 15 or 20 amp receptacles. So a 15 amp receptacle like this one, we're going to have a uh, the grounded or the neutral power rail. We'll have a ground or ungrounded or a hot power rail. Uh, we're going to have blade receptors, which is where our plug blades actually fit into. And then we'll have a grounding yoke or the ground yoke. Um, so, and that's where we'll have two openings for our um, ground pins. As you can see, and I'm going to try and find the Oops, right here you can see this is our break off tab. So if I want to have a split receptacle or maybe I want to have the two receptacles controlled independently, um, I can break that off and now I can wire those different, that power rail or the two terminals to two separate um, circuits. So, oops, get out of here. Trying to advance. Here we go. So here's a close up just showing the blade receptors. Those are those, the two U shaped um, portions of the power rail up top. You can also see the screw terminals on either side. Um, again, one of the things I skipped over from the previous slide power rails are generally going to be made of yellow brass. The ground yoke and the screws themselves are going to be made out of steel or zinc coated steel. I um, mean, that might be that or that becomes important a little bit later on when we start talking about fire exposures. Um, you can also see in here, and I'll pull up the little pointer again, this tab right here is the push in terminal or the the uh, backstab terminal. So that's how kind of the I don't want to call it the cheater way, but a quicker connection method to connect a wire to the receptacle. Um, it's a little bit faster, but it has some issues associated with it when it comes to fires. All right, so here's a power rail taken out of the body of the, the 
receptacles, again, just kind of different orientation. One thing that's worth taking note of is if you can kind of see these lines that run horizontally here, um, that's a, a little tool mark that's worth keeping in the back of your mind as we start looking at these um, in the event of a failure or in a fire scene. So I'll clear all those. All right, so just another orientation again, showing the blade receptors and the push-in terminals and the screw terminals. So a 20 amp receptacle has all the same components, but if you look really closely, you'll notice a few key differences. Um, the first is you'll, you'll see the, we have a neutral power rail that has a horizontal plug blade opening. That's so you can have a specific um, plug blade or plug that'll fit a 20 amp plug or appliance can plug into a 20 amp receptacle, but you can't plug that 20 amp recept, uh, appliance into a 15 amp receptacle because we wouldn't want that. We'd overload that device. Um, so you see that's got an associated separate terminal uh, on the blade receptor. You'll also notice we don't have push-in terminals. There's a manufacturers were forced to change that um, years ago. I don't actually know, remember off the top of my head when they instituted that change, but they no longer um, allow 20 amp receptacles to be backstabbed or have push in terminals. Um, you also notice this still has a ground yoke, but it is um, routed along the back side of the receptacle. Again, just a close up. You also notice probably that the components are a little bit bigger because with higher currents, we need larger conductors so we don't to dissipate the heat generated. Um, you will notice on this one, if you look closely, this one does not have the little marks underneath the screw terminals. Um, I'm, I honestly haven't gone out and bought one of every receptacle to see you know, which manufacturers have them and which ones don't, but just something to keep uh, in the back of your mind. Again, just kind of changing the orientation so you get it, all the different views. All right, so here's looking at the back side. So you'll see on the uh, 15 amp receptacle on the right, it's got the holes in the back for the push in or the backstab terminals. The 20 amp receptacle does not. Um, one thing to note is the holes in the back of the 15 amp receptacle are sized just right that they'll only accept a, a 14 gauge conductor, copper conductor. They're sized perfectly so that you cannot fit a 12 gauge conductor, which is what you need for a 20 amp circuit. Um, there's a reason for that. We'll get to that in a little bit. And so here's what they look like in an x-ray. Um, you can see there's the 20 amp receptacle just has a lot bigger components. Uh, again, that's just to handle the increased uh, current load. Otherwise, they're pretty darn similar. So here's with a plug actually attached. All right, so there's typically three different ways you can wire up or connect a conductor to a receptacle. There's the typical screw terminal on the left there. In the, the middle is the backstabbed or the push-in connection method. And then my personal favorite, which kind of, um, I'm not endorsing a brand or anything, but it's my personal favorite because it kind of combines the speed of back wiring or pushing in uh, using the push-in terminals with the security of the screw terminal. So this one on the far right is a backwired compression. So uh, where I've seen these most often is higher end receptacles like 20 amp um, receptacles and GFCIs where you stick the wire straight in the back, turn the screw and it tightens up that clamp and, and um, actually compresses the conductor in between the power rail and that uh, little pad of steel. All right, so when we talk about push in or backstab terminals, when you use that type of connection, the only thing that is holding a conductor in place in
Again, all you've got is that little, um, this little edge. Uh oh, my com internet connection is unstable. That's not what we want to see. Hopefully, it holds out. Can you go back? Uh, we, you cut out about 20 seconds ago. You're right. back now, though. Okay. Hold on. Let me get back. Go figure. My internet connection starts to crap out. Was that on this slide? Is that you, Chief? You can advance one more slide and go from there. Okay. So I, what I was just saying was the, the yellow circle here is where the conductor would be situated in a push-in type of connection. And um, the only thing, and I think I can kind of jump to this slide, the only thing that's holding that conductor in place is the spring tension of this tab. And it's just getting a little bit of a bite off of this corner, pushing that conductor into the uh, power rail there. So that's kind of one of the hazards per se of these push in or backstab connections. So that's what they look like in place. So you can see there's not a whole ton of um, surface area there or, or connection, I guess you could say, to, to hold it in place. Uh, you can see on this one, the, the terminal on the left was still in place and the terminal on the right's displaced a little bit. So that would be a fairly good indicator that this was probably wired with the push in or the backstab terminals. If you find wires sticking out of a junction box or an outlet box looking like this, it's also a really good indicator that it was wired with the backstab uh, terminals or the push in terminals. You also may find um, somewhere like a little bit of a, an indent or a, a tool mark where that tab actually bit into the conductor. Um, so that's another indicator if you can see that. Usually you can see it with your naked eye or maybe a, a little bit of a magnifying glass, but otherwise um, they're usually pretty easy to see. All right, so there's two broad classes of plastics, uh, thermoplastics and thermosets. <clears throat> so thermoplastics and then both of these have been used to make receptacles in, in, in the past. Predominantly today, uh, most current receptacles are made with thermoplastic materials. So thermoplastics are going to melt and flow when they're heated um, and they eventually will char. Versus thermosets were, tend to be seen, found in older structures and uh, I haven't, I've yet to see one actually produced today other than maybe more industrial type um, receptacles, but your typical residential receptacle, um, you don't see them made of thermoset plastics. And those thermosets char when exposed to fire, but they generally maintain their shape. They, they're pretty uh, robust when it comes to fire impingement. So um, let's say we walk into a room, we've got a, a fire that went, uh, you know, room and contents fire, we find a receptacle in the middle of a wall and there's nothing plugged into it. So the question is, can we rule that out just because there was nothing plugged in? Hopefully you're all, you're all saying no. There's two potential failure modes, even with nothing attached to the receptacle. The first one that everybody should know about is a high resistance connection. So if they're wired in series, meaning the current load on what the far end of my circuit, the dead end of my circuit, is pulled through all of my receptacles simultaneously, I could have a load uh, or a current flow through a connection, a poor connection that heats up at that connection despite the fact that there's nothing else plugged in. Um, the second one is arc tracking, which uh, we're looking, talking about moisture and or contamination getting inside the body of the receptacle and forming al an alternative current path. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so loose connections, um, we talked about how they can be um, connected. The backstab or the push-in connections have been problematic in the sense that they're not like a default horrible way to wire anything, but the, where they've become an issue is people either A, 
reuse them. So when you, if you take one out and you go and reuse it again and use that push in connection, that little tab has lost its, its uh, strength and the tension to be able to hold a wire securely. So you don't want to reuse those for sure. Um, the other issue is back when they used to make allow 20 amp receptacles be backstabbed, a 12 gauge conductor, which is what you need on a 20 amp circuit. Whoa, I tried to brush some dust off my keyboard and goofed it up. Sorry about that. Um, when you, because a 12 gauge conductor is uh, a lot large or is larger in diameter, it's a lot stiffer. And so when you go and push that receptacle back in the box and in order to put it button everything up, there's enough torque um, or force on that conductor that it will potentially, or it could wiggle that connection loose and cause a, a poor connection and cause some resistive heating. So that's why now they're only allowed on 14 gauge, um, 15 amp rated circuits. So again, it's not a inherently bad wiring method. It's just reusing them or using the wrong size conductor. Obviously there's the potential somebody could drill a hole out in the back of a new receptacle in order to fit a 12 gauge conductor in. That would obviously be against the manufacturer's recommendations and, and instructions. Um, but uh, it's not my, definitely not my favorite um, wiring practice. So what this typically looks like, this is just a lab generated high resistance connection. You can see the wire is actually starting to glow here. Um, this is a, uh, I think, I think it's a ther nah, it looks like it's a thermoplastic. Might be starting to melt and flow a little bit. Um, but you can see it's the wires actually glowing. And with because it's glowing, um, there's a couple of textbooks. Uh, the SFP handbook and Dougal Drysdale's Fire Dynamics textbook list both have charts that list the approximate temperature. Actually, this is a thermoset plastic. Sorry about that. Um, but they list the approximate temperature of a metal that it, or the approximate temperature and material or specifically a metal has to be in order for it to be glowing. And at the bare minimum to get something to glow a dull red color, it has to be um, about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So here's that temperature um, taken out of Drysdale's textbook. So at a minimum, we're talking about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit for something to be glowing. It's definitely going to be above the ignition temperature of most common combustibles. So in that sense, now we got to start figuring out where's our fuel, what is our fuel, how does that, the location of that high resistance connection play into my ignition scenario. All right, so Hughes and Associates, or Hughes Associates did a very extensive research project that wrapped up around, oh goodness, 2012 to 14, if I remember correctly, where they tested a lot of receptacles and generated a lot of high resistance connections. And some of the common characteristics or symptoms or signs of a failure that they found were, was this list here. So oxidation, um, corrosion, de-zincification of metal components, say that 10 times fast, localized melting at the connections, uh, a welding bead appearance around the screw terminal, severed conductors because you know we're getting fairly quickly once those um, connections start to glow and the wires start to glow, we're approaching the melting temperature of the copper. So we can have those melt. Um, because of the corrosion, we can actually have the screw heads get larger and then formation of copper oxides at the connection. Uh, again, I kind of like to point out, you don't have to have every one of these to say a high resistance connection was present. Um, one of the things that I like to point out is um, Joe Sesniak, a few years back, did a, a small research study where he created some high resistance connections on receptacles. And if I you remember back early on on the 15 amp receptacle, I had those lines underneath the uh, screw terminal. In every uh, high-resistance connection he made, those lines were destroyed. 
So he created a high resistance connection in a lab and then what, and he documented them and he could, and then he took those same receptacles and he put them in a compartment fire and allowed the compartment to go um, past flashover. So then he looked at everything again. And one of the things he found was even after a fairly extensive fire, um, you could tell that the, um, the lines where a high resistance connection was present, those had been damaged, but at the screw terminal immediately adjacent to that one, where there wasn't a high resistance connection, those lines were still present. So that was just, it's another indicator to kind of add to this list that if I'm missing them at a connector, at a screw terminal, um, then, you know, that might be a good indicator that a high resistance connection was present. It's kind of like, you know, uh, when we talked two weeks ago about identifying arc melting on conductors, um, there's really no way that fire is going to be so precise that's going to, that it's going to affect one screw terminal and not the other. So if I'm missing that on one terminal where there's a connection, I might need to start going down this road. All right, so this is that welding bead appearance that the, the Hughes paper was talking about. You can see it's, for those of you who have welded, it's, it's pretty darn obvious. Um, and you can also see on the right side where the terminal or the conductor actually severed. Um, it's a little blurry on the left, but it's actually severed in that case as well. You can see here they had, um, because of the oxidation and the corrosion, the screw head actually gets bigger and bigger and loses its definition. So just another indicator that they've got some localized heating going on there. So just kind of from my own experience, um, this was a fire I worked when I was working on the private side. And I actually went to this fire about two weeks after I read this paper by Hughes. So I was kind of giddy when I found it. One of the things you'll notice if it's not super um, evident is, draw it a little bit here. This was the original conductor and it's the old, what I call legacy non-metallic sheath cable. So it's uh, two conductors, maybe three, but it has the, the rayon or the cloth insulation with a, kind of a tarry um, pitch to it. And down here is brand new or relatively new uh, PVC insulated NM cable. So obviously these were not installed at the same time. This fire was kind of a tricky one because we first walked in the room and the fire department and the cleaning company had already ripped out every piece of sheetrock. So we could not figure out that there was even a fire there until somebody looked behind a box. And this was the only fire damage in the whole room outside of uh, as far as to the structural framing. All right, so close up of the receptacle, you can see we have a really nice connection down here, no evidence of mass loss or melting, but then we've got this really nice welding bead coming around the screw terminal and then that conductor is severed. So something is amiss here. Um, what we ended up finding oops, was that, here's just a close up, the current tenants of this structure uh, had set up a grow operation in the basement and the new wiring with the PVC insulation was feeding that entire grow operation. And we went through and calculated there was no damage in the basement. So we were able to find every appliance and device in the basement and just look at the labels and add up the current load. And we had 15 amps of uh, load in the basement alone, not counting whatever was attached um, or plugged into this receptacle. Now, the interesting thing about this case was um, the timeline of the fire. So these tenants had been in the, the home for quite a long time and they had had the grow operation set up for a long time. And, uh, but they hadn't had a fire until, you know, the day they had the fire. And the one thing that changed was something that we learned through an interview. And that was that the tenant's girlfriend was complaining because his bed was on the outside wall of the structure. We lost again, Cam. 
and before that they had a dresser there. So we had a Cameron, Cameron, we lost you again there for a bit. All right. Where did you, where'd you lose me? We were discussing where it was located. Okay. Jason Wall. Yep. So, so, um, sorry, folks. I don't know. Didn't have, have this happen last time, at least this many times. Um, so what happened was the, the tenant had moved because his girlfriend complained about a lack of insulation in an exterior wall he moved his bed to an interior wall and ended up putting it right in front of this receptacle when originally there was a wooden dresser in front of the receptacle so the thing that changed that led to the fire was a change in fuels and the change in configuration all right so when just to kind of wrap up the connections i'm an engineer so we got to throw some math at you. You know, we need every connection should have continuity and mechanical security. Um, so here's kind of just a very simplistic uh, example of why this is important, why these low resistance connections, uh, you know, or having the, the electrical continuity is important. If I have a connection with just a tenth of an ohm of resistance, um, and I have a 10, ohm, 10 amp load on that circuit, I can actually generate 10 watts of electricity at that connection point. And 10 watts over a very small area creates some fairly localized heating. So that's where the danger is, is uh, lurks is because it's so localized to a small area. All right, so what we're gonna be looking for, um, again, most of the time we're, we tend to be looking for uh, screw terminals and push-in terminals. Uh, and so you can see on these examples, uh, on the left, our power rail's actually been completely destroyed or almost completely destroyed and melted, but you can see how the conductors were wrapped around the screw terminal. Um, I can still rule out a connection failure in this case because there's no corresponding damage to the electrical conductors. So I don't necessarily need to have the entire connection, both sides of the connection present to rule out a connection failure. I need to have at least one half of it though. Um, so the one on the left is a little bit trickier, but the fact that I don't have any damage to either of the conductors um, would allow me to make a, a determination that this was not a connection failure. The one on the right is obviously pretty darn easy. Um, so, I didn't, I don't have pictures in this uh, of a, but I actually saw pictures of my first um, push in terminal failure just a few weeks ago. And the reason I don't have photos, it's a, it's an active case with a fatality. So it's still a, an active investigation, but um, just kind of in the, what, almost 20 years I've been involved in the industry, um, you know, not necessarily investigating fires all that time on my own, but in the 20, you know, 19 years I've been involved, it's the first time I've actually seen a push in terminal failure. So it just kind of goes to show, um, I think the screw terminal failures are probably more common because I think there's a heck of a lot more involvement with a screw terminal as opposed to just sticking a wire in the back of a receptacle body. Um, this is just kind of a, an example of showing you know, just because I have melted brass here doesn't mean this is a receptacle failure. It's kind of a trick question. So this one was definitely a little more um, something worth looking at. So as you can see on the right side, I've got a little bit of a bite taken out of the um, break off tab and I've got some melting on the screw terminal. And you know those screws are steel, so they're going to melt at about 26 to 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's generally only going to happen when I have um, some sort of electrical activity. I might be able to get it from alloying, but generally it's going to be some sort of arcing event. So this is something that we need to look at a little bit more carefully. Again, another type of receptacle failure. Uh, this one's most likely a an arc tracking failure, but because there's a lack of fuel, didn't go anywhere. So before we get to the last, the other failure mode, we've got this little wrench and things that we can actually get 
arc melting in a receptacle just from fire impingement. This and this receptacle as an example was a training burn down in Huntsville at our uh, National Center for Explosive Training and Research. This was actually out of a test or a training burn for the advanced origin and cause class. So you can see on the right is a face on view. We've got one power rail here and the students in this class brought it to me and they said, hey, what's wrong with here? And I said, what's wrong with this? And I said, nothing other than you're missing this power rail on the right. And I said, and I had to follow it up with, you need to find it because this little arc site here is kind of important. So they went digging a little bit more and they found that power rail. And you can see here, there's a tiny little arc site on the matching screw head. So in that case, because you can tell all the plastic is molten and re-solidified in the bottom of the receptacle, it's a thermoplastic receptacle. So what happened is as fire, as fire impinged on this receptacle, the plastic started to soften and melt and deform. And now the conductors inside the receptacle are connected to the receptacle. We're able to push the parts around and you can kind of see, whoops, you can kind of see how this wire here kind of kicked off to the side. Well, that pushed the power rail into the side of the box and allowed it to short out to the side of the, the junction box. Now, the funny thing was in this same compartment, six feet away on a different wall where a lamp was plugged in, this arc melting happened. And you can see there's a heck of a lot more damage here but you can see where we're missing. We've uh, got arc melting on the plug blade. We're missing a good chunk of this um, ground yoke and a good portion of this power rail. We're missing both blade receptors. So same compartment, same fire. Both of these uh, came from the same exact room, but it was an intentionally set fire, it had nothing to do with the electrical activity on these. Both of these were a function of fire impingement. So Devin Palmer did his CFI candidate project, which all of our CFIs are required to do a research project. And he looked at what happens when fire, in, fire impinges on receptacles. And so he looked at thermoset, thermoplastic, and GFCI receptacles, and he did them both with and without something plugged in. So one kind of interesting thing um, was that GFCIs, you know, they, they kind of have maybe an overly simplistic uh, description, but they have a little bit of a circuit breaker built in. They have circuit protection built in that can trip the GFCI alone, but not trip the circuit breaker. Well, if you have something plugged into that GFCI and fire impinges on that cord, you're very likely to get arc melting or some sort of fault on that power cord, which can trip the GFCI. The thing is, you still have electrical uh, power up to the receptacle, and technically you still have components, like this screw terminal is still gonna be energized in relation to these contact, and what I, I call them contact fingers, or these contacts. Um, when the circuit opens up, these are now disconnected from your power source. So what would normally be the same voltage between these two, now I have 120 volts down here, and zero volts up here. And now I can have arcing occur between those um, contacts. And that's what happened here. You can see we've taken off uh, this whole contact here and we've kind of deformed this contact uh, compression terminal down here. So here's a few examples from Devin's uh, research. Uh, he basically found, you know, once fire impinges on a thermoplastic receptacle, a lot of times the uh, parts would shift and it would either arc to the junction box or the metal face plate um, or the metal ground yoke. Here's a screw terminal. So in all of, one thing to remember or what he found was in all of his tests, if you had a cord plugged into the receptacle, every time um, arc melting occurred on the cord before would, it would ever happen inside the receptacle. So if we've got something plugged in, we should be looking for our activity, electrical activity on the power cord attached to that receptacle. 
if there's nothing plugged in, there's a possibility there's arc melting inside the receptacle. If it's a thermoplastic receptacle, um, those parts can shift. They never got arc melting in a thermoset receptacle. Remember, thermosets, the ones that hold their shape, they char, but they don't shift. Um, where they got arc melting was behind the receptacle on the wiring that powered the receptacle. So there was no, uh, again, just to kind of summarize, no arc melting on the thermoset receptacle itself. It was all in the wiring behind the receptacle. So um, the big thing here is, you know, there's still some ongoing research that we're trying to do at the lab about, is there a certain threshold or critical level of fire impingement on a thermoset receptacle where we will get uh, arc melting to occur? Everything we've done thus far has shown that to not be the case, that we do not get arcing in thermoset receptacles, in the receptacles themselves from fire impingement. Um, the problem with thermoset receptacles or th the problem with doing that follow-up research is getting the receptacles. They're, they're not really made anymore, at least that I can find them. And so you have to go scrounging around old structures that are being demolished or have some, know somebody who's doing a remodel. Um, I was fortunate enough last summer, they tore my old elementary school down. So I got to, my brother and I got to spend a few hours written around and took filled up two five gallon buckets full. But otherwise it's kind of hard to find these things to do research. So Jerry Gallagher was another candidate um, and he did his research project on arc tracking and receptacles. And this is very uh, typical of what I would expect to see in an arc tracking failure. So I've got a pretty good bite taken out of the ground yoke right here. I'm missing a good portion of my power rail. Um, both should be something that we be, are looking for when we have a, or during a fire investigation. So this is all kind of case studies that were, these were receptacles given to me leading up to this research project. So this first one was uh, provided by Matt Beals with ATF and Pat Buckley from San Diego Fire. It was a receptacle installed in a garage there was nothing plugged into it. Um, if you look closely, you can see that I've got no blade receptor here and I've got no blade receptor here. So something fishy is going on. This was the actual scene, um, fairly localized damage, uh, fairly obvious area of origin. This is the receptacle itself um, where it was installed no wall panelings or anything, or anything like that. And this was just a bunch of boxes on the workbench in front of it. So here's just a few more photographs, um, kind of some close-ups. One thing that we've started to notice with all of these is this very localized charring on the plastic between the ground yoke and the power rails. And when we look at these, um, the, the handful of these I've seen in l real fire scenarios, I've always been able to find this localized damage that was still evident even after this thing went through a rip roar and fire. So if you find evidence of something like this, that may start to point you in this direction of a arc tracking failure. This was another case study. This one was in St. Paul. So I got this receptacle from my dad, but this one was actually witnessed. So somebody was sitting on the bed. They had a cell phone charger with no cell phone attached, but the cell charger was plugged into the top receptacle of this um, outlet. And they actually saw a spark fly out and ignite the bed. And they put the fire out themselves with a fire extinguisher, a dry chem extinguisher. And this is what it looked like when I got it. So I x-rayed it first, and you can't really see anything in the x-ray. Um, if you look really closely, in the bottom right uh, blade opening, you can see it's a little bit discolored. Otherwise, there's... Lost you again, Cam. Yep. Where'd you lose me? 10 seconds. 
10 seconds. All right, I'm gonna try and, well, I don't dare plug it in. <clears throat> I'll mess something up if I try and change something now. I, what I just said is if you look at this, the bottom right receptacle or blade opening, you can see there's some discoloration there. So this is when I popped it open and you can see all the, the dust and stuff that's from the dry chem extinguisher, but you can kind of see some discoloration in this area. And that, once you cleaned it up in a, an ultrasonic cleaner, that's what it looked like. So there's a lot of localized charring to the plastic between the power rail and the ground yoke. And it's hard to see in this picture, but you can see a little bit of a bite out of the blade receptor. And what you can't see is there is a tiny bite right about here on the ground yoke, but it was on the face of it, not on the side. So when you looked at the x-ray, you couldn't actually see anything in the x-ray. <clears throat> All right, another case study. This is going back a little bit further and I never actually looked at this receptacle, but the fire department was ready to call this the electric baseboard heater that ignited the bed. And this was actually a fire my dad worked and this was many years ago, but looking back, um, you can see that this is a thermoset receptacle, maintained its shape really well, kind of looks like just surface scorch. But when you pop it open, there's a ton of damage on the ground yoke. And then you're missing this entire power uh, blade receptor. So definitely something kind of screwy here that's going on. Here's just a couple of other examples. And here's that same receptacle here popped open. So bottom right or top right, I guess in this case, would be the whole blade receptor's gone. So I have to thank the guy because, you know, yeah, he gave me great genes, but he also gave me this great research idea where we took 504 receptacles, installed them on a rack and put them in a little room and seven days a week, twice a day for 30 minutes a shot, we sprayed them with water. So you can see all the piping on the ceiling. So it's kind of a dorky project. Not a whole lot happens right off the bat. Um, but after six months, if you look in the bottom right of the corner of the screen or the bottom right of the rack, right there, if you're waiting for a big explosion that's typical of a Novak family test, you're not gonna see it. I'll play it a couple times. There it was. Once more, for those of you who still missed it, All it was was a little arcing event. <clears throat> so six months in, this is my first failure. So I x-rayed it and there's really nothing obvious in the x-ray um, unless you really know what you're looking for. And I honestly didn't see anything in the x-ray and I saw it after I took the thing apart and then looking back at the x-ray, I could see where the damage was. So if you look, obviously here is all our damage. See, I'm gonna pick another color. That's not any better, is it? I'll stick with red. But if you look very closely in the x-ray, just that little gouge right there in the blade receptor contact, that's all that's the damage that you could see on the blade receptor or the power rail and everything was on the surface of the ground yoke. So an x-ray in this instance couldn't really tell you what's going on. <clears throat> so here's the same receptacle. Not a whole lot of damage um, from the exterior. You can kind of see the blade opening is definitely deformed and, and discolored. A lot of localized damage on the plastic between the ground yoke and the power rail. All right, this one, forgive the Blair Witch type video on the plant, but you'll see. Oops, don't pause. See, right above all the charring, there's arcing going on inside the receptacle. What's he doing? 
So that's exemplary of what's going on in these types of failures. So what's happening? Like I hinted at before, we're getting moisture and or contamination in the receptacles. It's forming this alternative current path between the power rail or rails and the ground yoke. And eventually we have enough current flow that we have some sort of arcing event which could eject a spark and ignite some sort of fuel if it's in the vicinity. But the question is, is there a fuel? What is that fuel and where the heck is it in relation to my receptacle? Um, you know, if it's five, six feet away, probably that spark is probably not a Compton ignition source for that fuel. Uh, you know, the further that spark has to fly, the less energy it's going to retain for ignition and the more difficult an ignition is going to actually be. So that's currently what we're trying to actually do. Um, at the FRL, we've, we're kind of spinning up a project. Uh, it's going to kind of be dependent on when we're able to actually get back to work and travel, but we're going to try and look at or evaluate is there a critical distance where, you know, beyond which a spark is no longer a Compton ignition source? Obviously, as you can imagine, it's, pro it's not a very simple question to answer. So one of the first hypotheses that we ran across or came up with was, is moisture condensing on the vapor barrier in these exterior walls? And is that somehow running in to the body of the receptacle and causing this arc tracking. Um, and that's kind of where we how we formed the test procedure in the first place. What kind of shot that out of the water was I've been to at least two failures, two fires, where we attributed the ignition source to a receptacle and the receptacle was mounted on an interior wall. So, um, but in, you know, so it's kind of like, oh crap, back to the drawing board. We still know that there's moisture or and or contamination getting in there. It's just a function of how. Again, most of these failures are going to be in receptacles that are quite old. So um, they've been in service a long time. Both of the ones that I that I can remember off the top of my head were fatality fires. And in both instances, one had a couch pushed up in front of the uh, receptacle. The other had a bed pushed up in front or immediately below the receptacle. So we had a very easily ignitable fuel in both cases. All right, so kind of coming near towards the end of this, and I know we're getting close to seven o'clock. Um, if you found arc melting in a receptacle, now what the heck do you do? You know, we have to look at everything in context. What's our big picture? We need to first question we should always ask when we're hypothesizing an electrical ignition source is what's our first fuel? Again, like I hinted at before, where is it? Where is that fuel in relation to our ignition source? The greater the distance, the longer it's going to have to travel in order for ignition to occur. And if we have something plugged into both receptacles, what are the chances that a spark's able to ignite um, something if it can't get out of the receptacle? Uh, again, it's dependent on what's plugged in and if it, it takes up all three openings, hot, neutral, and ground, or just hot and neutral. This means though, we have to be looking at all of our receptacles in the area, or even, you know, I tend to use the room of origin to be on the safe side. Uh, but at a minimum, that means we have to take it out of the, the junction box or the outlet box, because we can't really look at the screw terminals or the push-in terminals if it's still in the box. And we may have to remove the plastic in order to look at the ground yoke and the power rails. Um, if you don't, you know, you can't do this, you don't feel comfortable doing it, you feel it's too far for your abilities, that's fine. Um, but then we're going to have to be leaving a lot more of these fires as undetermined, um, which is perfectly acceptable. You know, you shouldn't do any more than you feel comfortable doing or trained to do. So, so we got it. This kind of brings us into the logical discussion about spoliation. So 921 describes it as, you know, the loss, destruction, or material operate alteration of something that could be potential evidence uh, and it's done by the person who has the responsibility for its preservation. That's every one of us when we go to a fire scene. Um, the decision on what's going to be collected or what's important kind of rests with the individual investigator, but what has to be kept in mind is what may be important to me 
might not be important to the next guy coming along behind me or the guy standing next to me. So you really have to be kind of thinking outside of your own little sphere about what might be important to somebody else. An interesting section, if you, and a very pertinent section in 921, if you've never read it, is 1710.1. Um, so, and what the three questions I want you to, to remember, and specifically the, very, the first one, is what's the difference between destructive and intrusive? Um, that's the big one that I want you to think about as we go through this. So 1710.1 uh, says, you know, if we're going to look at something, sometimes we have to make some sort of alteration to that evidence. And if we don't do that, we really can't effectively examine it um, or evaluate it. So, uh, you know, that might mean we have to, you know, take debris off or uh, open up some sort of panel. You know, we have to get at these components in order to do our jobs thoroughly and completely. And a lot of times we can do this without changing the value of that evidence. So, you know, kind of digging deeper, you know, we might be removing a cover, opening a cover um, or a door. We might have to cut away or clean off charred material or debris that's trying, that's preventing us from observing what we're trying to get at. <clears throat> And it just 921 goes on to say, hey, we might alter the evidence, but we typically don't alter the over, overall evidentiary value. The caveat being, you do this carefully. All right, so if you don't know, you don't feel comfortable, find somebody who is. You know, do the bare minimum that you, you, know, that you can do, um, go only as far as you feel comfortable and competent and qualified to do and then ask for help. So to summarize all of that, you know, if you have the training, but you're comfortable, don't touch it. If you don't have the training, but you're comfortable, you're probably the most dangerous fire investigator out there. You still shouldn't touch it. If you have the training and you're comfortable doing some sort of exam, what's your, your employer or your fire department or police department, or whatever, say you're allowed to do. If you have the authority to do it, you may be um, in a position to go ahead and, and tear into these a little bit more, get a little more involved. I didn't make this up. This has been in 921 since 2011. So it's been in there for a while and it hasn't changed. I went back and checked. As far as I can tell, it hadn't changed. The big thing though, and you know, the big caveats, the big disclaimers are, you need to document the crap out of this as you do it. Um, you know, there's going to be somebody coming along behind you who's going to want to look at this stuff and it may be important for them to see it the way you found it. Um, you're definitely going to not want to take a hammer to it and, you know, to get through this plastic. You're not going to want to be cutting willy nilly and ended up breaking stuff. And the big thing is if they're, you know, receptacles, when they're wired with the push in terminals, those power rails fall off really easily uh, and can be lost really easily. So if you find wires sticking out of the junction box, like I showed in that earlier photo, but they're not, the power rails aren't attached, try looking straight down below and dig through the debris. Chances are you'll have a good shot of finding them. Um, again, don't damage or lose the stuff. Once you find it and you've examined it and you find that, hey, there's nothing there, don't go throwing them into the debris pile because you know there's nothing there worth keeping. Um, keep them with the, re the rest of the receptacle, keep them in the box. I tend to carry little Ziploc baggies and I'll put the components in the bag and then shove them back in the box. If possible, and they, the power rails haven't come off, I may even mark what conductor was attached to which push in terminal or, or screw terminal so that you know somebody could come along behind me and take a look at them and figure out where they actually came from. Um, you may also want to, you know, keep in mind that maybe the plastic could be important to somebody. Um, I don't typically find lost you, Cam. Cam, we lost you at. I don't typically you know, find. Cam, we lost you at. I don't typically find. Oh, I don't typically find, I don't typically find the, the plastic 
as very important. So I, you know, but I still try and keep it when I can. Hopefully that covers that. Um, let's see here. You know, uh, so a good piece of advice I got from Bob Toth, who's listening in, kudos to you, Bob, was, hey, if you're going to a fire scene and you need to tear something apart, it may be beneficial. Go to another room that's unaffected by the fire and practice on one of those. And that way you aren't messing with a piece of uh, what could be a piece of pivotal evidence. So last couple of slides here. Here's how I go about these. Um, the best place access point is right where the ground screw is attaching to the ground yoke. Um, it's a nice, stable, solid surface. If you take a flathead screwdriver and pry up um, at that point, and you just kind of work your way around the seam, uh, you know, trying not to stick the screwdriver all the way in because you can kind of mar, um, scrape, and, and push parts on the inside uh, around. And then as you're working your way, way around, um, you can use some leverage from that screw terminal up here and kind of get underneath that ledge where you can see the little shadow. And that kind of helps um, get around these. So, you know, on a receptacle like this, where it's very minimal fire exposure, it's a little more involved. They're fairly easy, um, but it, it takes a little more oomph behind it to break that plastic when they've been through a fairly significant fire and all the plastics melted off, the work's already done for you. Um, as you saw, some of those thermoset receptacles, those still maintain their shape, but they're very brittle. So you can take the face of those off really easily without doing a whole lot else to the, the receptacle and damaging a whole lot else. Um, that's pretty much it. So, you know, now's the time for questions. So if Fulton wants to Yep, so I have a question for you, Cam. Um, <clears throat> and the question is, many fires involve heavy soot generation. During restoration, cleaning takes place, but receptacles are not cleaned or replaced. Do you think that this type of contamination could lead to potential outlet failures? I would have to say it, was, it probably could. I've never thought about it. But yeah, I, I don't know if I could rule it out per se. <laughs> Anything else? That was the only one that I had that was messaged to me privately. You, you, there was another one, but it was answered already. Okay. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen for me. I'm going to throw up a couple of polls. And if you guys could just take these polls for us um, you know, while we're sitting here. I'll wait uh, a minute or two to see if there are any more uh, questions at all, and then I'll stop the recording. So if anyone has any questions and you want to <clears> unmute <throat> yourself and ask Cam directly or message me um, directly, um, we'll, we'll wait a few minutes. <clears throat> more. I see a question there about re recommend move, removing the faceplate every time. I, I think it's a judgment call. Um, You know, if you're, if a receptacle's in the middle of the room, you know, or, you know, middle of a wall, not with no fuels nearby, you might not need to. Um, I've had, I've had a double filicide case where I pulled receptacles out of the walls all the way across the room, separate from the origin, because I didn't want to leave anything to chance. Um, Cause we knew it was, we had a sneaking suspicion it was a set fire. Um, so that's, I mean, it's kind of a judgment call. It's all up to what you're comfortable with, um, and what your training is, you know, like I said, instruct intrusive versus destructive. To me, I look at intrusive as following right along with that section in 921, as opposed to destructive, meaning, um, I might be changing something forever and ever, you know, I may be manipulating a switch or something like that in an appliance. So. But I'm also an engineer, so I tend to be a little more, have a little more leeway than most people with, and I work for the government. So I have more leeway to do a lot of these types of exams. Let's see here. 
Joe says, art tracking and outlets installed in unfinished basements. Hmm. I can't say I've got any sort of statistical analysis that would say, you know, I have, I see them more in one certain, you know, setting as opposed to another. Um, the two that jumped to mind that I was referring to that were both fatals. One was in a basement, but it was installed. Uh, if you kind of picture um, a center concrete masonry unit wall, and you could basically do laps around that wall in the basement. The receptacle was installed in the middle of that wall. The other one that was a fatal was the exterior wall on a main floor um, in a single family dwelling. So. Uh, those are the, you know, you saw the one from, the one was in a garage in the case studies and the other one was an exterior wall of an apartment. It, you know, I don't know if there's anything that says they always happen in a basement um, where there's moisture or anything like that. Any other questions? Yes, you'll get a certificate for this if you take the test. Any other questions? Yeah, we can also see, stop yeah. the recording and yep. people might want to speak up then. There's one more. We'll take this last question and then we'll stop the recording. Yeah, so if plugs are present, you know, is it likely? Obviously, if I plug something in, um, you know, if I have one plug in and it depends on the configuration of the plug, it's kind of the, the short answer is it depends. If I've got a, a two prong plug, I still have the potential of something popping out the grounding, the ground pin opening. Um, if they're grounded plugs, you know, now all three openings are closed. So, you know, it really depends on what's your situation. Um, obviously, your the ability to eject a spark is going to decrease with the number of openings you are covering up. Um, the one thing that I've been kind of thinking about is the new new construction typically has tamper resistant receptacles, which have a shutter that covers the hot and the neutral plug blade openings. So you have to plug something in in order for those to slide out of the way for your plug to fit in, but they don't cover the ground pin opening. So I actually just went through and re uh, or replaced every receptacle in my house. Um, because they were all backstabbed and they were all uh, daisy chained or wired in series. And I've replaced everything with a tamper resistant, A, because I have a nine month old and B, because, you know, I was thinking about this at the time. Um, but it doesn't necessarily completely eliminate that risk because the ground pin uh, opening is still open. Kim, I've posted the test, a link to the test there. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end the recording and then I'll share with you the other classes we're doing as well.